All right. Good morning, everybody. How are we here? Okay. We're on. Hello. Very happy to be here in Poland. It's a beautiful city. And my talk and my design career started about 12 years ago with this guy. This guy's a dead ezer. He's a typographer in Tel Aviv, in Israel. He makes amazing fonts. And he was my first teacher on my first week of school at Shankar College. And as a lot of you design students know, your first year you work on small things. So he told us to all go home, take a word, and put it on a piece of paper. That's all we needed to do. Everybody came back the next week. I chose the word hi, and I put it on the lower part of the page. And then everybody puts their papers on the wall, and we go one by one, talking about the composition and this. And then he gets to me, and he tells me, Adi, why did you decide to put your word here, pay attention, and not here? And I didn't know what to tell him. Like, what the fuck is the difference between a few millimeters at the bottom of the page, whether it's here, whether it's here? And I was really frustrated because I didn't have a good answer for why did I put my word there. And all I was thinking, like, what are you talking about? And it was really, really confusing, but it got me thinking a lot about all the different pixels and how pixel perfect matters. And I started investigating that for my years to come. And we'll get back to that as we continue the talk, as we search for that perfect pixel. So in today's ad agenda, we'll be talking about making design decisions, how we make design decisions, Fibonacci in nature, what is the Fibo design system and how we use it to measure hierarchy and aesthetics, layout, typography, color tints, and UI in general. My career started at a company li called Live Person. We were 60 people. Today, they're about 2,000. Um, and I spent six years there growing as a designer. Once I left that, I said, I could do this. I could do my own startup. And I went out, and I quit, and I launched a startup called PixSplit, which was all about connecting collages and different photos. And it started just like that. And it won design awards in Israel and the Dribble Award. And the idea was simple. I was in one place. I put in half of my photo. And let's say my wife or my girlfriend's on the other side, and she connects it. And we kind of share a moment. But this is where users have a life of their own. See, they turned it into something a bit different. My idea was connecting people. And they were, turned it into something that was connecting different collages and making some new form of design. If you're, you get something, and then all of a sudden it completes it with something completely different that's surprising, funny, um, emotional. Like, you have a shark fin. What can connect to a shark fin? And then you see that the people all over the world were connecting just a bunch of photos together. And we got to about a million users within nine months. Remember, this is about eight, nine years ago. We were featured by Apple on 150 um, countries around the world. And it was a good experience for me. And then we ran out of money, and we had to close the company. Um, so we launched another company. I joined another two partners, and we launched a Skype Viber type um, voice application. And the idea was that everything was transcribed. You can search your calls. You can look for a specific call you spoke about something. And part of the UI was for iPhone and Android. And we launched that for about three years. And then we went off and created something for B2B and enterprise solutions. And here, once I finished over there, I joined a company called Move It. Move It today is the world's biggest transit data company. There's over 170 million people. This was my first experiencing on a large scale. When I talk about large scale, we gave support in 72 countries, in 1,600 cities around the world, in 44 languages. 
as your designers understand, this is where our problem starts. How do you create one UI to rule them all? 1,600 different cities with one UI, where some people in New York will use a lot of subways, some people in uh, Brazil will use a lot of buses. So how can you take one UI and be able to give that to 1,600 different users and be able to give a good experience? Here's a small sample of just stations around the world. You could see that they all have their own colors, their own shapes, some are circles, some are squares. I'm never going to know what image is going to come into my UI. Other than knowing your UI, you need to be present as you're showing in the UI what we see on the ground. This is a photo from Brazil, a bus stop. You see the bus stop? No, you don't. It's that ugly pole over here on the right. And if I'm at the end of the street looking for my bus stop, I can't see it. I need to make sure in my app that I'm showing exact placements as bus stops are moving from places to places. And what info am I getting? I'm not going to every single city and getting this information. I'm getting these all through APIs. So my API says, this is bus number 343. This is 353. But as you could look on the buses, that number doesn't even appear on the bus. So if I'm looking for that bus 343, I'm actually looking for the Cifrol bus. So we don't know this until we have a huge community. Now, other than providing the right information, we have to take into consideration cognitive bias. There's so many things that come to us on a day-to-day -day basis. So what should we remember? I'm going to talk to you today here about a lot of things. You're not going to remember everything. What are you going to remember? There's too much information. And other than that, in a fast-paced world, we need to act fast. So we don't have time to all the time research and see all the different solutions that are possible. And the last thing is sometimes there's just not enough meaning. And I'll give you an example. When the first car was invented, we needed to explain to the people, what the hell is a car? So the closest thing we could do is tell them it's a carriage without a horse. So we detach the horse and it goes by itself. So we got to move it. It's a new area for me. I didn't work in public transportation. But very quickly, you understand that public transportation is about three main things. We're about directions, we're about stations, and we're about lines. To be able to understand how we can provide all this information for all the different cities, we built three different apps, three completely different apps that provided the same information in a different UI. And here you could see the three tests that we did and how the information architecture was presented. Once we did that, we wrapped it all up, put it in the oven for three months, and then for three months, you just pay attention to the users and see how the different engagement how the different retention acts. And since we're not there, we need to use a lot of different products that help us do that, like AppSy or Google Analytics or Tableau. Here you could see a breakdown of different usage of one of the apps. And if a user is coming in the middle, what different screens are they going into? Are there places where they should be, where you could see the small areas that not many people are going there? Is, this is my eyes on the UI. And it comes in all different forms of different graphs that you can just put them down and look at all the different screens and how p different ones are behaving. And after three months, we need to make decisions. So three months after, we all gathered around and looked at all the data. We said, OK, some in Argentina, for instance, this worked great. In uh, Italy, this worked great. In the US, this worked great. But we can't maintain three different UIs. So at the end of the day, the one that was the one that won was this one. This is the one that gave us the best retention, the best engagement, and the best overall usage that helped us provide this for the rest of the 1,600 cities that we have around the world. Other than just finding what the right UIs are, we do what we call optimization snacks. Optimization snacks will help us check very micro interactions of what will work best for different areas. 
For instance, we, had a, we have a feature that lets people add a photo of the bus station to the app. So we have a white one and we have a blue one. So which one are people going to press on more? How many of you think that more people will tap on the blue one? Everybody thinks it's the white one, really? Wow. Well, 73% more people will tap on the blue one. Now, it makes sense. We, you might have heard the link blue, like we're used to things being blue and then they're clickable. So 73 more people are tapping just because we inverted the different colors. Or what's better, a nice simple play button to start your directions or a big start live directions button at the bottom. So we tested all these, and you can see that there's a big difference by putting a button that has very clear instructions of what this action is about to do. So 31% versus 22% did that. And then another thing we tested, it was not an exact test, but we used to have top navigation on, on our apps. We cleaned it up, and we noticed that not many people were jumping between apps. As soon as we cleaned it up, and we had it at the bottom with three different um, actions, you see a huge difference of people jumping between the different tabs. So you, we're working really hard to make all these information for the people, but if only 8% are going to only leave our home screen, it's going to be really tough for us to actually make a difference and provide the most useful information for this. So other than just testing, like, qualitative data, we always look at quantitative data. So we actually go and we have focus groups and we talk to people all over the world of how they could see this. How is the best way to perform this for their persi persistency? And we go on to the buses and we talk to people um, and we ask them different things. Here you could see Batman on the bus here talking uh, with one of our users. And this is the, the qualitative data. It's the real qualitative data that helps us really talk to our users, see their reactions, see their emotions. What are they expecting to happen when they press on something? So other than making all these decisions, we do a lot of research. We have to create pixels. We have to actually go and create these screens. And this is where my romance with Fibonacci comes to play. This is Fibonacci. He was born in 1175. That's a long time ago. And it's always interesting for me to see that someone that lived so many uh, hundreds of years ago actually helped me in my career. So his real name was Leonardo of Pisa. And what did he actually find out? Fibonacci found out that in nature, there's an aesthetic code. There is something that repeats itself in the different DNA of different elements, organic elements that we have on Earth, how is the shell developing? What is the radius? What is the width of every developing object that we have? And these patterns, they come back and they repeat themselves in so many different elements across the world. And that really fascinated me. When you take this and you, tr when you, take this and you translate this into a number, this is what happens. This is the Fibonacci sequence. And how does it work? You have 0 plus 1 equals 1, 1 plus 1 equals 2, 1 plus 2 equals 3. So the sum of the two numbers are always the following number that it's following in the series. So how do you look at this in nature? If we have a sunflower, what is the ratio between the radius of the flower and the petals that are growing around it? So if the maker of this flower needed to decide how much, this is the way to measure the different things. And how can you present so many seeds in what pattern? Because as you can see, they come in a spiral. And the reason for this is the sunflower needs to maximize the amount of seeds that it can produce as it continues to develop. And to do that, it grows in a certain pattern. So, this pattern has been used in different things like Da Vinci, in art, it's in our faces. What's the ratio between our eyes and our nose and our mouth? What's my forearm and this? And how is the ratio between each one of them? 
I'm sure many of you are familiar with the golden spiral. The golden spiral is exactly inside of it is where you could find the Fibonacci number. So it goes 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 8, 55. These are the Fibonacci numbers. And it's everywhere. You all probably know all the paper system, A4, A3. This is the same system that takes something and sums one piece to the other one, and which is the next one that comes to mind. And that's when FIBO design system was born. For the past eight years, I've been working exactly on that. FIBO design system helps me measure hierarchy, gives me a reason to make a design decision for pixels. And it's made up of my five best friends. This is Leo, Caesar, Paul, Bob, and Sammy. They are the ones that help me make decisions for whether it's UI, whether it's physical spaces, whether it's art. And when we start working, it's like a little dance. Once we have our wireframes sketched and we need to actually place elements on the screen, then it's like a dance. And I'll let you see what I mean by that. There you have it. So what did we just see? We know that we want to build this design. We know that we need to make a lot of decisions on these pixels. So for instance, we decided that we want to have a photo at the top of our app that will help us personalize the experience for different apps and also give us a place for monetization and being able to make some money. So how big is this image going to be? So Leo helps us by using the height of the screen, and it helps us understand, out of all these pieces, how much of this hierarchy will be taken up by a photo. And by under that, we'll need a section header. How big is this section header going to be? Other than that, we need to decide where our menu and our top lines are going to be. So as you can see, it's a dynamic grid. The photo actually turns into our canvas now. The photo is what we're placing elements into. So the different dynamics of the grid fits itself into our different needs. What size will our margins be? We'll take our width of our screen, and we'll use that to decide how, width, how the width of our margins are going to be. The good thing about this is, like in Android, for instance, we've got thousands of different phones, different sizes, different resolutions. By using percentage, it makes it that much easier to decide how much of this uh, margin is going to be. We have to have a little circle there. How big is this circle going to be? So it's all like a bunch of Lego pieces that comes together because everything is connected to everything. We don't actually need to make sense of every different one, but everything is connected. You can see that the cells over here, well, it's a little bit on the projector, hard to see, but by using the height of the screen, we understand exactly what pieces will fit good with the rest of them. And it's not only me, because I'm part of a team, obviously. We're six designers at the movie team, so everyone is in charge of different areas. By using the same tools across the different product, we are able to save consistency, work together, and make sure that one screen fits the other one. And it doesn't matter if you're working on screens or you're working on marketing materials, for instance. If we have to create a banner and we want to make sure we're consistent. So we'll use the same exact scenario by building this. We'll measure the banner and we'll place the different elements exactly as the tool helps us to understand and margins, the different size of the phone, where it's going to be on the right, where it's going to be on the left, what's the size of the logo. This is what helps us make a decision that's backed with some kind of purpose and reason that
that helps us continue. So let me tell you a little bit more about SIBO and how it works. So this is something that I've been using for about eight, nine years. And in the past year, hundreds of designers have gone through workshops with me to see how that they can fit this into their designs. So it's a dynamic grid system, and it's a theory. It helps us to measure the hierarchy and the aesthetics, and it helps us make faster, precise design decisions. Now, it's important to understand, this is just another system. It's not the only system. It's another system that you could use, just like we have all kinds of different grid systems we could use. This is just another one that we're able to use, but it's dynamic. So what's the FIBO sequence? It works the same way as its two numbers are the sum of the next one up. So 6 plus 10 is 16, 10 plus 16 is 26. As, as you can see, the sum of this is all 100%. So I was looking, if I need to divide any space into, uh, from 100% in five different sizes that are relative to each other, how is it going to be? So how does it work? Leo is built, and just like the other tools, for five different pieces. 6%, 10%, 16%, 26 and 42. That's what makes up all the tools. So whether you stretch it, you widen it, you can twist it, it's always going to keep the same exact ratio and proportions. It doesn't matter how you stretch it and change it. And what do you do? How do we actually measure it with FIBO? And how could you use it yourself? There's two main things you need to know about measuring with FIBO. In design, everything is either relative to another element or relevant to another canvas. So if I have a title and then I have a subtitle, the subtitle is direct ratio to my title. I don't know what my subtitle will be unless I know what my title will be. So let's look at two different measurements we have. As you follow along, you can see the orange one all works with a parent and its children that accompany it. So we have, let's go back. So we have the parent is like the title. And what are the elements that are fitting into this specific size that work good with each other? So as you can see, each one, if you start from the top, the first two together is the sum of the third one up. If you need something that's bigger than that, it works the same. This is the same sequence. We'll take the biggest parts of the tool and combine them together, and that will be the next one up that comes as the bigger part of the piece. But we don't actually need to do this. You could just measure the parent by being the small piece inside of this. And by measuring this one, it will give you what is the size of the bigger pieces that come. And this could be um, you know, a caption of a photo. If this is the caption, how big is the photo? And this is what helps us make the decisions between elements that are small, elements that are big. That's the one simple measure we have. Another one we have is actually taking a specific space and dividing that. For instance, you're creating a business card, and you need to place a logo in the middle of the business card. How big is this logo supposed to be? It's not one, but there's different sizes that we can do. So by dividing the specific space, it kind of gives me all the different building blocks that will fit good into this specific space that we're talking about. And I'll give you a very, very basic and simple explanation of how this works. This uh, slide is made up of a photo and three thumbnails. The photo is relevant to the slide, so we'll measure the slide. And what you can see is we use the first two as the margins, which is the 16%. And this is how we decided the height of this specific photo. Once this photo is created, we need to decide what are the sizes of the different thumbnails around it. 
So we'll measure the photo. The photo is the direct relation to the thumbnails next to us. So this is the tool. We measured the actual photo. And then what we did, we used the first three to decide what is the size of this thumbnail. Now I know this is a very simple thing, you just divide it by three, but it gets more complicated as you build bigger and screens that have a lot more elements than we have here. How does this come to play with typography, for instance? How am I going to take this and make sure that the typography works good with all the different elements that we're creating? So let's look at that. How can we take type and create good hierarchy in the different typography that we're making? So by using the different sizes, it gives us five different typography hierarchies that you can see work really well with each other. Each one is distinct. Each one has its purpose. It's just like it's a user experience. Each size of the typography has its purpose. So we have comments, we have the captions, paragraph, subheader, and it doesn't matter how we stretch it, it's going to keep this in the same exact ratio. What we always need to take into consideration, though, is legibility. If the bottom one is going to be too small for us, then it's not going to be any good. So it's a little bit more complicated than that, but we have to take into in consideration how we're going to do it. Let's look at this composition for a sec. Every one of these design decisions here was made with this tool as you see it over here. So you have the title is 42%, which is the biggest part. You have the subtitle is 16%. You have the dots that are 6%. And the 10% is the running text that you have. Not only the elements, because we know that space between elements is a space of its own. That as well is measured with the same exact tool. And there's endless options that you could see with it. So you could see that also the spacing, this one uses the top three. This one uses the bottom three of it. And this is what, it's like a visual calculator. That's all it this is. You can make all these decisions if you're really smart in math and really quick. And you can just divide everything and create it as it should be. What the tool does, it gives us just a visual calculation of the different hierarchy that we're trying to build. Another thing you can do, and what many people have done, this, again, I did not invent this. These are the Fibonacci numbers, 13, 21, 44, 63, 1 of 7. If you're a young designer and you're struggling with typography still, and you want to make sure your type has exact hierarchy between the different typography, you could just use the Fibonacci sequence. It uses the same exact ratios between each one. And when you place them together, you will see that there is a clear relation between the title, the subtitle, the spacing, and all the different running that's coming around in this design that you could see. Color. More color tints. This is something I'm really, I was really bad at. Someone asked me, What's the, what are you bad at? Color. They really suck at color, and I need help with that. And how does it come to play with Fibo? So you'll need to, a lot of time, create a designs and have different tints of the color that you're working. So move its color is orange, and I needed different tints to create a ratio that will fit good into different designs. So what do we do all the time? We'll move it a little bit left, a little bit darker, a little bit lighter. We'll multiply by 10s or 20s. We'll do like 0, 10, 20, 30, 40 percent. So what we can do with FIBO is we'll slice it right down the middle. And it will sample 10 different samples of this orange and narrow down our decisions. It narrows down our decision. And with FIBO, like every decision, you are the designer you are the one that makes the final decision. I take these 10, and to make it easier, we usually work with a palette of five different colors. So the five different colors that I choose are these. And again, it's dynamic. So depending on what color you're using, what is the different ratio and contrast that you're looking for, this is what it will help us when we actually put it down on paper. So you could see here that 
there's good differences and jumps between the different colors, as you can see the different percentages. And to make it simple, all this is is taking orange and mixing it with white. So 100% orange, 84% orange, 68% orange, etc. And this is the same thing if we turn it into using it with black. If we want to go for a darker one, we'll just mix it with the darker blacks. And it gives us another palette that will help us create it in a very good hierarchy manner of the different color. What else can you do, again, and always, is use the Fibonacci numbers. These are the Fibonacci numbers, 21 through 89. will give you the good jumps. And this is just like another system of using what a lot of people do and I used to do a lot, just jumping 20, 40, 60, 80. This is another system. This is also a system. It's going to be a little bit harder on this screen to understand, but this kind of gives you a barely smooth gradient that has equal parts of jumping, while the other one gives you more jumps between the different colors that you have. When you have a second on your computer, if you look at it, you'll see it a lot better, as you can compare by having the same jumps between the different colors or using the Fibonacci sequence to use each one of the different colors. So that was Leo. Leo is used for 90% 90, 90 of the decisions that you'll have. But we also have things that are circular. So that's what we have Caesar for. Meet Caesar. Again, he's built from the same ratio as the rest of the tools are built. And how do you use Caesar to make decisions? For instance, we need to have a button that has an icon inside of it. So we have the button, we have the tool. We'll combine them together and we'll need to place a star into this circle. How big is this star supposed to be? So we have a star. I'll stretch it right now to this specific height. And you can see that the ratio of the star to the circle fits really good. It fits really good and it feels steady and the hierarchy between the white space or orange space around it works really well. And as you could see, it has different steps. You could have made it smaller, you could have made it bigger. There's different sizes that you can play with it. And what are the different use cases that are used, for instance? Like a simple, simple use cases, because this is like a five-hour workshop that I do usually, that we created, for instance, we need to decide what are the margins on our page. So here you could see the margins on the small ones use 6%. Or you could use, the other one is 10%. So whether you need something that's more uh, dense or more wide, it changes as your designs are changing. I need to place type on a different path. I could actually use 10% margin for each one and make the typography fit within. I don't necessarily need to measure the typography. I can measure the page and make sure that there's an element that's going right into this place. And this is the same exact thing. You could see that the measurement here is the width of the canvas, and 10% of it uses the margins to place it, and also the bottom one. So other than taking FIBO and building apps and making posters, it kind of took over my life. Um, my wife asked me to put shelves at home, for instance. How am I going to place the different shelves? I, have, I could put them in a really even space in between, or I could measure the actual height of this pole and decide how I'm going to place this. I did an experiment by seeing if we measure the face of a different model, how can we create sunglasses, a line of glasses that will fit each one differently? Because we're all unique. You all have different faces. This specific example shows every decision in making these glasses was taken into account by measuring the model's face, the model's um, head, the spacing, what's the spacing between it, how curved are the radius of the different lenses. They all come to play. If I needed to do for il illustrations, it's like Lego. You know, my friend had a daughter and he wanted to put illustrations on her wall. So we built her all kinds of different stickers that are all combined with color and the sizes. And I'm not an illustrator, 
And as I narrow down all these options, it helps me make decisions a lot easier than I would by just eyeballing it. Other than that, instead of taking Redolin, I kind of sit and play with different pieces just to kind of focus myself. And you could see that using the thousands of, uh, hundreds of different pieces, they kind of always connect with one another. And when everything connects, it's like Lego again. We're building things together. So we put it in there. The last thing I've done with it was a little bit of a form of art. If we take different um, clear plastic and put it together and build this little art, and we need to place this in someone's home now, how big is it going to be? So if this is my living room, I've got my wall. What I'll do is I will measure the wall and decide what's the size of the piece that's supposed to be in here that will fit in the best possible scenario. And that's how we decide what is the size of the different um, element on the wall. Here you could see a little prototype that we created to see how the different ratios work with one another and how the different shades of the colors are going to work with one another. And this is a line of many, many different figures that come. So as you could see, you can really measure everything. And I encourage you to actually go ahead and do that by you can take your time, and once you finish this talk, you can actually go to FIBO.design and download them for free. They're free of charge. You can download it. You can play with them, and you can see how you can take this and fit it directly into your designs because it's, not a, it's a dynamic system. You could download it, and you can play with it, and soon there will be more online um, material on this for them. So, thank you very much for listening. My name is Adi, and I hope you have a great day at the rest of this conference. <laughs>